Hi, everyone, and welcome to yet another podcast and YouTube video on uh, Gaudium at Space 22. Uh, and it's been a while. I mean, I did one with Dr. Rodney Hauser a while back, but I've been traveling a lot and uh, giving a lot of talks all over the place and still writing for Catholic World Report, the National Catholic Register, and so on. So I've been a bit busy. And so it's, it's I've, th these uh, video things have been a uh, podcast have been a little few and fewer than than usual but i'm hoping to change that over the course of the next week or so i don't have another speaking engagement for a while now so that's good anyway i'm very excited today as i'm always excited for the guests that i have because i have a former student of mine here is now uh you know uh, surpassed me in intellect and scholarship in many ways she is dr sarah hulse kirby uh, she was a student at DeSales University, where I uh, taught for many years, as many of you know. And uh, she went on to get a doctorate in theology from Marquette University. What year was that, Sarah? Um, I actually just defended in December. Oh, that's so, right. What am I? What am I thinking? Twenty twenty-two. So <laughs> fr a, fr a freshly minted PhD in twenty twenty-two from right. Marquette University, and you are now assistant professor of theology at DeSales University. Are you in my old office by any chance? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope I hope you you've got it decorated better than I did, because <laughs> uh, I, I went with the whole brutalist movement, uh, Spartan, nothing on the walls uh, <laughs> sort of thing. It just had a bad metal bookcase and a horrible desk. And uh, that was that. That's that's my personality. I, I, I never decorated my office in any way like that. So I'm sure it looks better now. I think I've seen it. So I'm sure it does. But anyway. You did your doctoral dissertation on the theology of Henry de Lubac. And for those listeners who do not know who Henry de Lubac is, which is what we're going to be talking about today, Henry de Lubac was one of the most important 20th century Catholic theologians. He was one of the founding members of, of what we can, what, what I often loosely call the sort of ressourcement theology, back to the sources, sometimes called communio theology. He was indeed one of the founding members of communio, the journal, along with uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar and Joseph Ratzinger. He was friends with both. Uh, but he was also a man of controversy. <laughs> okay. And uh, so he was for a long time under a, a cloud of suspicion because of his theology of nature and grace, uh, but he was sort of uh, rehabilitated at the Second Vatican Council and was very influential there. He became close with uh, a certain bishop named Carol Wojtyla, uh, and, and, and actually then once Wojtyla became Pope John Paul, John Paul made him a cardinal, I believe, in 1983, Sarah? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay, and Sarah, uh, and Sarah wrote her dissertation. Did you do it on nature and grace? No, I did it on de Lubac's Trinitarian anthropology. A wise move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a wise move because the, the nature and grace thing is flooded with all kinds of uh, commentary uh, back and forth, back and forth. So uh, his right. Trinitarian theology is probably a much neglected sphere. So kudos to you for doing that. But you have sent to me uh, a little tiny article that you are uh, going to, you're brushing up for eventual submission for publication wherever. Uh, and the, the, the name of this, I love it. As soon as, uh, I don't know who it was. I think it was Hauser, Rodney Hauser said, oh, yes, you got to talk to Sarah because she's doing this thing on de Lubac. And it's called the seven myths about Henry de Lubac. And so today this is great. I rarely have such a nice skeleton uh, outline to go by as I do these interviews. So I'm just going to go down each one of these myths that you list here. I just finished reading it this morning. I was out with friends drinking liberally last night. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't dare read it last night before I went to bed. So I read it this morning. So actually now it's, it's fresh in my mind. Uh, and so here we go. Let, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, myth number one you list on here is, uh, de Lubac and his ideas on nature and grace were condemned in the encyclical Humanae Generis. And those who don't know, Humanae Generis was an encyclical issued uh, by Pope Pius XII in 1950. And uh, the, the, the general wisdom has been uh, that Humanae Generis was a condemnation of the theology of nature and grace that one found in de Lubac's writings. Uh, and, and so you call that a myth. So uh, I've read what you wrote here, but I'm going to let you explain it since you're the guest. OK, why is it a myth 
that Henry de Lubac was actually censored uh, specifically in, in Humane Generis or his views. He wasn't mentioned by name, of course, but his views. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, uh, Larry. So, and, and this one's interesting because I've heard it repeated um, both by um, critics of de Lubac, but also by some of his companions, um, people who are trying to claim him as an ally, but they also will say um, de Lubac or his ideas were condemned in Humane Generis. Um, and I'd like to clear that up. So um, paragraph 26 says, you know, others destroy the gratuity of the supernatural order since God, they say, cannot create intellectual beings without ordering and calling them to the beatific vision. Well, de Lubac thinks that all human beings are in fact called to the beatific vision. Um, it, he believes that we have a natural desire for God, for the beatific vision that's part of our nature. Um, and so some people interpreted that to be that de Lubac thinks that God had to create us that way. But of course, de Lubac's position is that God did not have to create us that way. He was not obliged to create us that way. Um, he, he created us that way freely. And, um, you know, some have, have argued that de Lubac clarifies that after, um, Humana Generis, that he sort of alters his position to say, well, you know, God was not required to create us in this way. However, um, in a late life interview with Angelo Cardinal Scola, when asked about that paragraph in Humana Generis, de Lubac admits, he says, actually far from containing any rebuke, um, that passage in the encyclical borrows a sentence from me to express the true doctrine. So de Lubac claims that the encyclical was actually influenced by something that he wrote and um, the sentence he's referring to comes from his 1949 essay, The Mystery of the Supernatural. Um, so written a year before Humana Generis comes out, de Lubac writes that if God had wanted, he could have not called this being that he gave us to see him. Um, in other words, God was not obligated to create us in this way. Um, God did create us in this way, but, but nothing was... Um, there wasn't a demand placed on God to do so. And so de Lubac sees his position um, as really the same as Pius XII's position in the encyclical. Well, that's very, very interesting uh, because, I mean, the, like I said, the common wisdom is that it was condemned. Uh, and yet you're absolutely, and I was among those, I'm, I, I freely admit, I was among those companions of de Lubac, let's put it that way, intellectual companion, I didn't know him, of course, uh, that thought, well, yeah, Humane Generis was directed. Now, a little bit of background here for, for the viewers and listeners, and I probably should have done this in advance. Uh, the debate that we're talking about is precisely centered around de Lubac's claim that our natural human nature has a single final end which is a supernatural final end, uh, but that uh, God does not for all that owe us grace, despite the fact that our nature has this call to this supernatural end. Uh, to the, That view was criticized by many of the Thomists in the pre-conciliar area in like the 30s through the 50s uh, as, as basically making human nature supernaturalized from the get-go. And we're going to come back to that in a, in a later discussion here. Uh, and thus, the, the term was phrased by um, a, a few other people called, the, a few people called the Nouvelle Theologie, the New Theology, uh, which is, we're going to see as we go along here, something that de Lubac despised. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So then the debate went back and forth, basically between French Dominicans, French Jesuits. And uh, and and so the idea was that uh, de Lubac is part as uh, a sort of crypto modernist who wants to supernaturalize human nature and naturalize grace. And, and so it all falls under this cloud of suspicion that, according to de Lubac, God owes us grace because we have this inbuilt sort of a call to a supernatural end. Okay, so that's the debate. But as, as something that you point out here in this opening discussion of this first myth, um, well, let's, let, let's, let's hold off on this because this is going to come up later. So let's just stick for now with the very specifics of this, of this very first uh, thing here. So that's the debate. And so the, the, the assumption has been that 
humane generis uh, silent. Well, we'll come back to that too. Humane generis condemned uh, De Lubac's views uh, in condemning the Nouvelle Theologie in general. The idea was that humane generis uh, condemned De Lubac's views. Now, your claim here is that this is, you know, according to De Lubac himself, this is not true, and that the encyclical actually quotes then something from him in his 1949 essay, The Mystery of the Supernatural. I'm going to ask you a very blunt question. Do you think that claim by de Lubach is true, or you do you think that he is being a bit cheeky here and saying, look, look, the Pope says something here in Humanae Generis that sounds exactly like something I wrote in 1949, so he can't possibly have had me in mind, right? He couldn't have had me in mind when he wrote this. Um but maybe Pope Pius XII didn't read the 1949 essay. Maybe right. it's just maybe it's just kind of a coincidence that uh, that because you know if he's quoting De Lubac, you would think that Humanae Generis Generis would give a reference to De Lubac's article. That I I'm quoting De Lubac here. So what what do you think? Of, I'm not saying I agree with my own my own thoughts here. But what would you say to those who would say that De Lubac's just being a little having a little fun here with the Thomas? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, he, he might be. But at the same time, um, I do think that the evidence speaks for itself. You know, maybe yes. Pius XII hadn't read that essay, but De Lubac is consistent, I think, throughout his theological career um, in insisting that when God gave us this um this desire for him, um, he was not compelled in any way to do this. Um, De Lubac says that really there's a parallel between um, the first gift of our existence and our nature and the, and the second gift of the call to the beatific vision inscribed in our nature. Um, the parallel between them is that both gifts are given freely. So God did not owe it to me to create me. God created me totally freely without me placing some demand on God prior to my existing. So God created me in freedom. And then second of all, he created me freely with a desire for him at the heart of my nature. Um, and that Ooh, is De yeah. Lubac's position, I think. Very good. You know, and, we're, and we're going to unpack that in a bit. Uh, so yeah. and, and the point the point, though, with with regard to this this first myth that Humanae Generis condemned de Lubac, whether or not the pope had de Lubac in mind or not is irrelevant. The, the, the deeper point that de Lubac is making is that whatever it is that Pope Pius XII is condemning here in Humanae Generis, it is not my views. All right. Exactly. Because this, Nor is de Lubac mentioned by name. I mean, he, yeah. Right. If you were really going after him, he would have, you know, mentioned him by name. De Lubac is not mentioned, and and this does not describe his position. Right. So, humane generis, objectively speaking, and regardless of whatever sub subjective sub sub subjectively the Pope had or had not read, the fact is, is that the view uh, that uh, the Pope condemns in humane generis is not the view of Henry de Lubac. And so, yeah, I think you are entirely correct. And it's a well-written, uh, you know, eight or nine paragraphs here that you lay out that Humanae Generis does not, in fact, condemn the views clearly expressed by Henry de Lubac. Um, and so we can now with a clear conscience say that the Pope, the Pope was not condemning uh, the views of uh, Henry de Lubac and Humanae Generis. So let's move on, unless you have something where you want to say on that point. I want to move on to myth no, number two. Let's move on. Yeah. Okay, because myth number two is related to myth number one. Myth number two is de Lubac was silenced by the church, sort of the magisterium, if you will, in the aftermath of Humanae Generis. Now, this, too, is a myth that I sort of partially kind of bought into. I was aware that, OK, he was never officially mentioned by name, but that he was silenced by Rome or whatever. Uh, and that's because I'm not really up on the historical particulars of it all. But you say that it is a myth that he was silenced and you give some really good evidence here. So go ahead. OK, sure. So um, this one, again, I hear from um, friends of De Lubac, but also um, even my students, um, some of my more traditionalist students um, or, you know, just faithfully Catholic students will say, oh, Dr. Hulse, uh, you know, De Lubac, wasn't he um, uh, silenced by the church? Um, and in fact, no, de Lubac was not silenced um, by the hierarchical, um, you know, Roman Catholic Church. He was silenced by his religious order. The Jesuits. Um, and it wasn't by the Jesuits, that's right. And it wasn't because of Humana Generis. Um, they actually silenced him two months before uh, the promulgation of Humana Generis. 
And um, the silencing kind of unfolded in, in various steps. So when first he was asked to, to step down um, from his teaching position at the Lyon Jesuit School of Theology, um, and then eventually they removed some of his books from the Jesuit library. Um, and, and he was forbidden from uh, writing on matters of um, technical matters of Catholic theology. Um, and so that's when he decided to write on Buddhism, um, which was not from a, a pluralistic um, Right. He was just making a, a from a Catholic perspective, he was writing on the, the pluses and minuses of the Buddhist religion. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, you, you know, so that unfolded in, in several steps, but it was actually a member of the hierarchy, um, a French cardinal, uh, Cardinal Garlier, who advocated for de Lubac's rehabilitation um, to de Lubac's superiors. And um, Garlier ended up in um, 1951. Um, making de Lubac his personal theological advisor and really pushing the Jesuits to allow him to publish and to teach. And so already in 1953, we see the Jesuits kind of giving in and allowing de Lubac to publish his meditations on the church. Um, and so he was not, he was first of all, not silenced by the church properly speaking. He was silenced by his, his religious order. Um, and yeah. Kind of in fits and starts. By, by the way, I'm going to interrupt you for just one second. Okay, the, the book that he was eventually in 1953 allowed to publish, uh, Meditation sur l'Église, you know, Meditations on the Church. I believe that's the same book which is now published by Ignatius Press, which I reviewed for Catholic Old Report, called simply called The Church. Am I, is that right? Um, I, I think that it's actually it became Splendor of the Church, and then you're talking about the ah. Church Paradox and Mystery. I, I think, although I want to double check that, but. Yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. The church paradox and mystery. That's so that's yeah. not the book that I reviewed. The book I reviewed for Catholic Word Report that is now at by Ignatius Press called The Church Paradox and Mystery. Yeah, that's that's a different book. This became the splendor the of the church. OK, yeah. very good. Well, just because some readers do like to look these things up and order the book. So uh, I always like to make that clear anyway. So I interrupted you, but but go on. Um. Yeah, so uh, so it was a, a Roman Catholic cardinal who was actually advocating for de Lubac's rehabilitation um, to his Jesuit superiors. Um, and in 1958, um, de Lubac sent several of his books to Pope Pius XII. Um, and uh, Pius XII actually received them very enthusiastically. And so he had um, his confessor, Father Augustine B., uh, write a letter to de Lubac on on his behalf and um in that letter basically that um father augustine b says you know the pope sends you wholeheartedly his blessings for your person for all of your works and he encourages you to continue with much confidence your scientific activity from which much fruit is promised for the church and so we see um Pius XII even eventually telling de Lubac, keep doing theology, um, your work is fruitful. Um, so in any case, my large point is just that de Lubac was not officially silenced by the church. He was silenced by his religious order out of um, an abundance of caution. So that was going to be my next question then, because by 1960, John the Twenty Third, in a sense, rehabilitates de Lubac entirely and makes him uh, a peritus, a theological peritus at the Second Vatican Council and was on the Theological Preparatory Commission uh, for Vatican II. So uh, de Lubac kind of comes full. He comes out of the cloud of suspicion and becomes a uh, a, a real uh you know, influence at, at the council. But let's go back to why did so the church officially in her magisterium did not in any way condemn de Lubac or silence, silence him. And you have a quote here from him where he says, during the whole affair, I was never questioned. I never had a single conversation about the root of the matter with any authority of the church in Rome or the society the Jesuits. No one ever communicated to me any precise charge. No one ever asked me for anything that would resemble a retraction, explanation, or particular submission. I think that last point is very, very important because it was sort of standard operating procedure of the church in those days coming out of the Holy Office. When If it officially investigated a theologian that it thought was heterodox, that theologian was in fact asked to publicly retract their views. Uh, or face some kind of further censure from, from the Holy Office. But de Lubac was, as you note here from this quote, was never 
who was never asked to retract anything right. that he wrote. So why? Why? So you say an abundance of caution is why the Jesuits uh, silenced him, so to speak. What was the source of that abundance of caution? Were the Jesuits stung a little bit by the debate, you know, between they, the resource Mont guys and the Thomas, and they just wanted this for political reasons within the ecclesiastical culture that they wanted the debate to die down. And so they wanted de Lubach just to shut up for a while. Do you, I mean, is that what you mean by an abundance of caution? Yeah, I, I think that two things were going on. Um, I think that de Lubach was already, um, you know, even 10 years prior, nine, 10 years prior, getting in hot water with his superiors, given his resistance to uh, the Vichy regime and anti-Semitism. And um, some authors say that that is connected to, um, you know, this uh, critique of the new theology, um, which I'll come back to. But, uh, you know, de Lubac was very critical of Vichy France, um, whereas um, Garrigou Lagrange, for instance, who goes on to write this article about what he calls pejoratively the new theology, um, which he associates with figures like de Lubac and Don Yilu, um, He's saying that they're doing new theology at the same time Lagrange and others had been sympathetic with, and, and de Lubac's Jesuit superiors had been sympathetic with Vichy France, and de Lubac was challenging that. And so some people say that there's um, tension there, both a theological but also political motivation going on. Okay, so let's stop there for a second because I think yeah. this is important in order to understand why the Jesuits silenced him. And a lot of it had nothing to do with his theology and a lot to do with the politics that was flowing out of France. And we need to remember how important. Uh, France was still to the church in, in that time, both both intellectually and, 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 and politically in other ways. And uh, even prior to the Nazi invasion, I mean, there had been a kind of um, a conflict within amongst French Catholics, especially intellectuals. You had uh, you had Catholics like uh, Gary Gou and stuff who were very sympathetic to what was called l'action française, which was a kind of integralist. If I'm you can correct me if I'm wrong, a kind of strong integralist restorationist sort of attempt to, in a sense, restore the church back to her privileges politically and otherwise culturally in France. So it was a very strong push for a kind of return to the glories of Catholic France and so on. Uh, the, and, and de Lubac, however, was more associated with the movement called Catholic Action, uh, which saw, sought to, in a sense, uh, not to not to pursue integralist visions of the union of throne and altar again, because also a lot of the L'Action Francaise was was looking was kind of monarchist, right? Uh, they were sort of opposed to the Republic and to the sort of secular as the lay, the, the lay secular concept of government. And there's something to be said about that critique. But anyway, de Lubac is part of Catholic action and he, he they want to, in a sense, influence culture more than because politics is downstream of culture. And de Lubac is essentially saying, along with others like Peggy, for example, that our, you know, our, the, the integralist moment has passed. We need to be aware of where in the hell we are right now in the historical landscape of France. And we need to focus our attentions on, on, on the culture. So then the Nazis invade and the Vichy government is set up and Vichy has a, a, a sort of sympathy with, uh, uh, action, l'action française. And so in defense of Gary Goulangrange, let's not paint an overly uh, polemical picture of him here. And I'm not saying you are, but some do. Uh, Gary Gou was not a goose stepping anti-Semite Nazi, you know, who, you know, who warmly embraced Nazi ideology or any of that. What he saw was a certain promise in Vichy politics that he thought might lead to the kind of vision uh, that he had in mind. Um, and and so I think that accounts for that. I, I'm getting a lot of this from the uh, great by uh, the great historical sort of analysis of this era by uh, Sarah Shorthall called um, Soldiers of God, you know, uh, something that the subtitle has to do with, you know, in a secular age. Uh, and, and so I think you're right. Uh, I know I'm sort of robbing your thunder here a bit and dominating the conversation, but I think it's important to understand because you brought it up, and I think it's terribly important to this discussion, why it was that the Jesuits silenced de Lubac. And it, it probably, in my mind, had more to do with the politics to which you just alluded than it did right. to any specific theological problem. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like you said, Larry, I mean, um, in the French Third Republic from 1870 to 1940, um, the church was excluded from French public life, not lightly. I mean, thousands of members of religious orders were kicked out of France. This is yeah. why de Lubac was not able to go to seminary in uh, France or you know, do his Jesuit formation, do his novitiate. He actually did that in England because he wasn't allowed to do it in France. Um, they closed the Catholic schools, and then they also cut salaries um, to the clergy. They took church property. And so the church had the rug pulled out from under it in a really big way. And so then when Vichy comes along, um, you know, Marshal Patan is, um, you know, claiming that he's going to bring back tradition and right. family culture and restore um, privileges to the Catholic church. Catholics are thinking, well, this sounds great. And De Lubac says, well, not so fast, um, not so fast. And so, um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, because de Lubac understood that Vichy was essentially a collaborationist regime with the Nazis and whatever whatever other good they might think they're trying to achieve in their political aims. You cannot get around the fact that Vichy is a collaborationist regime with vicious, vicious Nazis and other anti-Semites. And de Lubac was resolutely opposed to all forms of anti-Semitism. Exactly. And, And, you know, and. That's part of this. And we have to frankly acknowledge this. And you, you brought it up, too, that there were strong currents of anti-Semitism among the Jesuit hierarchs at that time. And a lot of Catholics today are, are ignorant of this history of anti-Semitism in, in let's put it, anti-Judaism uh, in, in, in many Catholic circles among Catholic intellectuals at that time. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's that's part and parcel of, of what's going on here. So uh, is there anything you want to add to that conversation before we move on to myth number three? I think I'm ready to move on. All right, then let's move on. Number three, De Luba, myth number three, De Lubac believes that nature is naturally graced or that grace belongs to the structure of human nature as such. This is an important one, and I've been sort of uh, forestalling this conversation, not wanting to, in a sense, undercut the meat of this particular myth that you want to debunk. So uh, this is the nature of the charge that in saying that we have a single supernatural final end to which uh, we are called that de Lubac is supernaturalizing human nature as such, that we're always already as creatures uh, supernaturalized and, and that our nature is, you know, is in a, has a single final natural and uh, supernatural end that therefore God owes us grace. So go ahead and debunk this myth. Sure. Um, so this myth, I think, let me start by saying, I think it's uh, rooted in um, two Aristotelian axioms um, that neo-Thomism um, accepts, which is that the end of a nature um, is proportionate to a nature. The end of any given nature is pro- proportionate to that nature and also is um, the end of a nature is within that nature's ability to achieve. And so to say that um, human nature has a supernatural end, as de Lubac does, would be to say that human nature is supernatural, right? It follows right. from that axiom. Right. right. Um, de Lubac says, you know, Aristotle's axiom can be applied to other sorts of natures, right? The end of an elephant um, is achievable by an elephant without supernatural aid. Um, but uh, with human I just, nature- I, just, I dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> it's awfully hard to be an elephant. I think they have to have God's help to be elephanty. But anyway, Ooh. that's a joke. Anyway, go ahead. I, did, I just couldn't resist. Go ahead. So, uh, so, but he thinks that human nature is a special case, right? Because we're image of God and um, created and called in, in Christ Jesus. Um, and that knowledge obviously was unknown to Aristotle who predated Christ. But since we now have the benefit of revelation, he thinks that revelation ought to inform our anthropology. Um, and so he thinks that um, the human person has a natural desire for the human, or I'm sorry, a natural desire for the supernatural, for the beatific vision. He also thinks that this is the position of Thomas Aquinas. So de Lubac doesn't think that he's inventing a new theology, that he's, you know, coming up with a new thesis. He thinks that this is the position of Thomas and um, end of the fathers and, you know, the, the 
uh, heart of the Catholic tradition. But um, you know, we have a natural desire for the supernatural, but he thinks that that does not mean that nature is supernatural. He thinks that to achieve the supernatural end, um, it can only be achieved through God's free gift of grace. God does not owe us that grace. Um, yeah, and that, fact, because because the because our supernatural end is is within us in the form of a call, not right. in the form of a strictly natural propensity um, or not propensity, but a strictly natural need. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's it's a call. So go right. ahead. Yeah, no, no, that's great, and it's it's you know the um, end is not in it's not proportionate to our nature. Um, so he says that we it's without proportion to what we're able to achieve. Um, and it's also not something that we can grow into like an acorn grows into an oak tree. Um, but it's, it's a desire. Um, Nicholas Healy calls it a readiness, um, this readiness, this waiting and anticipation um, for that, which can only be given to us in the mode of free gift. Um, so we long for that, which can only be given in the mode of free gift. Um, and this today, Lubach actually, um, the, the, an unfulfilled natural desire for the supernatural is what constitutes the pain of hell and, and, and the risk of hell. Um, hell is, uh, the, the pain of it comes from not fulfilling that supernatural end, an unfulfilled desire. Um, the, the, yeah, go ahead. I, I, yeah, go for it. <laughs> no, I was going to say that one of the things that I often like to bring up in, in discussing this with, with Thomas, who are critical of De Lubach, who want to so emphasize the sort of notion of pure nature that has no supernatural end or propensity like that is, you know, if, if that's true, then why is it that if I reject the call to beatific vision, if I reject it, then why is it that that consigns me to hell? Why should it not just consign me to a, a limbo of natural happiness? Why should, in other words, if, if grace is simply gravy on the potatoes, and I don't want the gravy. Why can't I still have the potatoes? Uh, and, and so the fact that perdition is the result of rejecting the call tells me that there is something deeply embedded in human nature as such. All right. That is oriented to that call, oriented to that fulfillment. And should it not reach that fulfillment, we don't then reside in a place of natural happiness. We reside in a place of natural unhappiness. All right. Exactly. Because. So go ahead. No, 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 that's great. Um, I, yeah, that, that's exactly de Lubach's point. And um, again, he, he's very clear that it's not um, growing into uh, the that nature doesn't grow into the supernatural, um, like a, a plant from a seed. This is something right. entirely new. Um, he says, uh, for instance, that the distance between nature and grace is as great as that between being and non-being, right? There's a, a, a chasm between nature and grace. So he does not yeah. flatten the distinction, but he does want to show that there is a correspondence between our nature and, and that which is given um, that we actually uh, desire it. I, I remember when I was taught this at, at the John Paul II Institute by um, Dr. David Crawford, he would say, um, if we didn't have a desire in any way for the supernatural, it would be like offering a filet mignon to a bunny, um, to a rabbit. <laughs> a filet mignon is yeah. amazing, but Absolutely. the rabbit would have no desire for it. It would just sit and stare at it, you know? And, and so to say that Christianity brings good news, um, you know, right. if we don't have a desire for that, which is given, then it doesn't really seem to correspond to us. It's like, OK, that's great. But, you know, what's what's the big deal? As St. Paul says, all things were created for him, by him, yeah, in him yeah. and so on. As we say yeah. at the at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, through him, with him, in him. Now, obviously, that's in the economy of salvation. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, as Paul reiterates, all of creation all right, is created within the logos, with, is created within that. So I'm reminded of a quote from uh, the great German poet Goethe, who, who said, uh, uh, if the eye were not already sunlike, then the eye could never see the sun. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's a very similar, uh, the analogy limps a little bit because uh, eyes are made to see light. It's part of their nature. Uh, and we're not necessarily like I said, strictly speaking, in need of the light of grace. Um, but but we are definitely 
we're, as you note here in this section, we're made in the image and likeness of God. And so that means we're dealing here with something that transcends the strict Aristotelian notion of nature's needing to have the capacity within them to fulfill whatever ends are there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and does, you don't mention this here, but I'm reminded, and I don't know where it is in the Summa, uh, Hauser would know, I think, because he's a genius. Uh, he's, he's maladroit and stupid, but he's also a genius. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Aquinas says that we can achieve things oh, through our nature that are, go beyond our nature mm-hmm. and that we don't have a capacity to achieve with the help of another. If That's we, right. If we have the help of another, then we yeah. can achieve things that we don't have a natural capacity for. Uh, and, right. so, and so by implication, you know, I, I, I have this, I have this natural sort of desire for God. I have a single supernatural final end that God doesn't owe to me, but he calls me to it. And he calls me to it because he knows he's going to gift me with the grace needed to achieve it. I mean, I'm, I'm being helped by a friend. And in this case, the friend is God. Yeah, that that's right. And um, uh, Healy, Nikhili again, and points out in one of his articles in Communio on this, that there's really a pattern of gift um, inscribed in in creation that this um, natural desire schema follows. And so even our being itself is a gift. And then because gift is a pattern, it's imprinted into creation, it's a logic in creation, um, it's not so arbitrary that our nature longs for that which can only be given as a gift, because our nature itself is a gift. And so right. giftedness is key here. Um, and yeah, I have written down, of course, I don't have written down where he says it, but Aquinas, um, and I got this quote from, from Healy as well, but he says that even though by his nature, man is inclined to his ultimate end, meaning the supernatural, he cannot reach it by nature, but only by grace. And this owing to the loftiness of that end. So Aquinas grants that we have a natural desire for the supernatural, and yet we can't grow into that or achieve it on our own. Um yeah, yeah it, it's, it's well, a free gift. Some, and I'm going to toss this in there, too. Uh, uh, sometimes I think that the debate over what it was Aquinas did or did not say on the issue of nature and grace uh, is a bit of an irrelevance. Not that Aquinas is irrelevant. He isn't. I mean, he's probably the guy we need to attend to more than anybody in the Catholic tradition and that by, with a certain magisterial weight behind it. Uh, nevertheless, it is possible that Aquinas was wrong whatever his view might have been, all right? It's, a pos- it's possibly may have been, let's say, for example, that the, the, the neo-Thomists are correct, the scholastic, the Lagrange is correct, that de Lubach gets Thomas wrong or something like that. I would say, okay, he got Thomas wrong, but maybe Thomas was wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, the deeper question is, what is the theological truth of the matter rooted in revelation? Uh, in that regard, de Lubach is part of the resource month school of theology is, is in a sense, retrieving the patristic Aquinas, Aquinas embedded within the broader patristic tradition. And uh, he, he therefore reads Aquinas through the lens of the church fathers. And I think that gives him uh, actually a better insight than the strict Thomas with regard to yes. what it was that Thomas was doing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, I'm teaching a, a women and gender class right now at sales, and I think that we see something similar with Thomas and, and also Augustine on um, the concept of woman, right? What Thomas says on women is largely informed by Aristotle, who thought that women were um, deformed or misbegotten men. Um, but we see John Paul II sort of- I'm refined. a misbegotten man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally misbegotten man. I'm a- Sorry, excuse for a man. But anyway, go ahead. And so we see, um, you know, John Paul II, Edith Stein, finessing Aquinas's view, correcting uh, some things that, that need to be corrected. And so we, we see this happening in other areas, in other words, outside of just the nature and grace debate as well. Yeah. And my point, too, with regard to the whole Tom, uh, what did Thomas teach, what he did not teach, is that given the times in which de Lubach lived, 
there was simply no question of saying, well, I don't care what Aquinas said. <laughs> yeah. uh, he may have said this. He may not have said this. There's here's one interpretation of Aquinas. Here's another interpretation of Aquinas. But let's just forget Aquinas and let's just go to the scriptures and the fathers and some other thinkers to lay out what I think is a better view of nature and grace. You can't you could not do that in 1930s, 40s, 50s yeah. Catholicism. You could nor in a sense I'm not saying De Lubach wanted to do that, nor should he have done that. Yeah. But it was right. even it was an even more acute and pressing need to exige to be to provide an exegesis of Aquinas during that period of time, because you could not get any traction anywhere unless you did that. That's right. And his nickname in the seminary was the Thomist. Uh, his fellow seminarians would call him the Thomist. I mean, he was always reading Aquinas. Um, his thesis is just, as you know, that um, Aquinas is, you know, neo Thomistic interpreters um, misread him. And De Lubach thinks yeah. that they actually so intentionally, but uh, that's not a story. Yeah. And, and and to backtrack a bit from my claim that in some sense it's an irrelevance what Aquinas said, because he could have been wrong. The fact is, he, he all pol politics of that time aside, uh, the church's doctrine on nature and grace is spoken and developed in the language of Aquinas. And so, in that sense, it's important to retrieve what it was Aquinas really taught in order to better understand what it is the church is actually teaching. Yeah, that's right. Especially since, you know, Leo the 13th and the, you know, Thomistic revival and renewal. All right. So uh, that that's the myth number three, uh, that De Lubach believes that nature is uh, super, uh, that nature is naturally graced and, and sort of already supernaturalized. Uh, and so I think, did you want to add anything to that uh, conversation before we move on to myth number four? I think let's move on. All right. Number four, uh, myth number four, De Lubach denies a natural end of human nature. Now, this is one that I knew was a myth, all right, that I knew that uh, De Lubach does, in fact, affirm that we have a natural end. So you go ahead. Sure. Um, so, again, this is one that I have seen um, written by, obviously, de Lubac's critics, um, but also some of his friends, some of his companions who say, oh, de Lubac says we only have a supernatural end. Um, and de Lubac himself gives that impression. Um, so he says, uh, for instance, in The Mystery of the Supernatural, he says there is only one end and um, I bear within me a natural desire for it. Um, so sometimes he says that there is only one end, um, but other times when he elaborates on the matter, he explains that actually we have a twofold end, natural and supernatural. This, by the way, is a challenge in studying De Lubac. Um, I think it was D David Williams said that a less systematic systematician than De Lubac is uh, difficult to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, sometimes he, you know, he says on the one hand and then on the other hand, and you can see why the confusion um, comes up around the Lubach. Um, uh, but, st well, stop there one second, because I want to yeah, address that because sure. the charge, the charge has been made by some, some of his critics who are more vicious than others, uh, that that de Lubach was actually not a very good theologian because he was not very systematic. Uh, in fact, I won't name a name, but there's a, a still living prominent Dominican who refers to de Lubac as simply a, a, a French dilettante Jesuit uh, and, and dismisses his thought as a kind of superficial grazing over the tradition, cherry picking from a catena, you know, of, of patristic quotes to say exactly what he wants them to say, but ignoring serious scholarship patristic scholarship as he sort of grazes through this haphazardly. What would you say to that chart before we return then to the- Yeah, uh, sure. Sure, thanks. Um, I think that de Lubac had definitely had an allergy to rationalism and to um, overly systematizing or overly defining um, the mysteries of God. So he wasn't anti-definition. He didn't think that, you know, knowledge of God is just simply beyond us and we can't say anything. He said things, but um, he, he didn't like the style of, of the manuals and also of neo-Thomism, which he saw as um, really being informed by this, um, you know, spirit of, of rationalism that wants things to be as clear and distinct and certain as possible. Um, for de Lubac, he thought that we needed to recover a sense of the mystery in theology. And, and mystery to him didn't mean... Yeah. inscrutability like oh we can't you know whatever we can't know but but for him it was really this invitation to wonder um the sense that you know there's an 
there's always an ever greater aspect to um to god um and so i think that um that was part of it um de lubac also he 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 studied for many years i think that he was brilliant um but he did not have a phd and um i i've heard some people say you know the the phd process forces you to um articulate you know really really precisely that no it doesn't saying. no no it doesn't uh, Okay. I know. Okay. Too, I know. I know too many PhDs that are flaming idiots to to come up with that yeah. claim. But anyway. Okay. Well. All right. So some people have said, you know, he he wasn't forced to kind of you know do that, but alas, um, he. Uh, I think that there was something intentional. Um, I think that there was something intentional about about his style. Well, yeah. Um, okay. So the reason why I bring this up, and then we're going to return to the natural end thing here in a second, is because. Uh, it, it cuts to the heart of the whole debate in some ways between Thomism and the resource month guys, because the the accusation even beyond de Lubac is that uh, the same accusation of dilettantism and the lacking of a real scholarship was also leveled against people like Daniel Liu, Balthazar, even Ratzinger. Uh, and, and and so the neo-scholastics, you see, for example, the French Dominican Liberté, uh who was actually somewhat sympathetic. To, he was one of the more irenic, as Matthew Minard, my friend, has pointed out in his historical research. He was one of the more irenic ones towards uh, the resource Mont Nouvelle Theologie, even though he was very critical of them. He said, we need to give them their day in the sun and let them shine and let them speak. And so we'll, we'll give him that. But Laberde went on to say, well, even if we need to allow resource Mont to speak, the fact is their theology is not scientific. The only true science of theology comes from Thomism, comes from the, and, and therefore Thomism and neo-scholasticism represents a kind of pinnacle of Catholic theology that we cannot prescind from and that we have to always return to as a boilerplate. And, and that's then that's because it's deductive. It's rational. It lays out clear and distinct ideas. It makes definitions and all that. Whereas you get the de Lubac types who are more mystical, poetic, lyrical, free ranging. And so the question is, uh, really, is the criticism of these French uh, Jesuits and uh, like de Lubac and others like Balthazar, is is that a fair criticism? I don't think it is. I don't think it's a fair criticism because what these other theologians are trying to say is precisely that neo-scholasticism and its claim of scientific status has overly rationalized the faith and has ignored the mystical spirit. I mean, the whole race, as Danny Drain said in a previous interview, and you know, Danny said that the project of resource Mont communio is really the bringing together of theology and spirituality again, which had been divorced in the, now it's a bit of a caricature. So Matthew Minard, please don't come after me. You to say that the neo-scholastics didn't care about spirituality. I mean, Lagrange wrote extensively on spirituality, but it, but the air of deductive sort of scientific theology as a one of the dangers within that method is precisely a tendency towards uh, demystif not de anti-mysticism in a sense and, and, and rational clarity. So I'm going to defend De Lubac and others here and others can maybe criticize me for this, but I, I don't think he was a dilettante. I think he was evincing simply a different method of theology equal in every way to the scholastic synthesis. So do you agree or disagree with that? I, I do. I do. And um, he also, uh, just to add to that, you know, if you, read his books they're just chock full of quotes from the church fathers and what yeah. you see with Bach is really him and he did this intentionally he was trying to move out of the way to let the tradition speak through him um and so he's quoting you know every other sentence there's a quote of some church father um but the work that, that would have taken to gather up all of these different uh sources i mean it's yeah very yeah. It's just such a fascinating and interesting period in Catholic Church history. Uh, there was a great article by Aidan Nichols in the, Jan I think it's the January uh, 2000 issue of The Thomist, which I sent to you and I'm sending to, but anyway, I probably shouldn't say that because behind a paywall, but you have it now. So I'm public, I'm a public sharer of things that are behind a paywall PDF. <laughs> uh, but in, in Aidan Nichols make, makes the point that there were, there were those who, uh, you know, on both sides of this debate that were rather polemical towards the other side. All right. But then he, he quotes someone, I can't remember who said that really in the 20th century, there was no greater debate, no more important debate going on than the debate that was going on in French Catholicism between these Jesuits and these Dominicans 
uh, at that time, uh, which is why I think your myths here are so fascinating, because uh, along with the work of people like Matthew Minard, who I've mentioned, who's doing great historical research, retrieving what it exactly was the, the neo-scholastics stood for, and they've taken it on the nose too. And there's been some caricatures about them that need to be myths about them that Minard is really good at debunking. So I'm glad now you are here and people on our side of this divide debunking other myths that have been perpetrated against sort of our our dudes, right? the resource Mont people. But anyway, let, let's return then to the, the to this idea that de Lubac, the myth that de Lubac denied we had a natural end. Sorry for taking you away from that, but go ahead. No, 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 that's great. Uh, yeah, so there's, again, a myth that, that de Lubac denies that we have a natural end um, of nature. And what's really at stake here, um, you know, when people make this claim, they're saying that de Lubac just absorbs nature into the supernatural and that that's how he does it, by not giving nature its own end. Um, de Lubac, however, if you read him carefully, and again, this is actually, he starts elaborating on this in 1948. So again, this is actually before Humana Generis comes out. So he's not tweaking his position in the light of Humana Generis. He's saying this two years before the encyclical comes out, um, that nature has a natural end and a supernatural end. However, um, he maintains that the natural end is, um, in the words of Nikili, again, uh, penultimate or, you know, of secondary importance. Um, now, he emphasizes the supernatural end, um, you know, obviously the most in his uh, in his work. Right. But I think that that, you know, can be understood against, again, his historical context. And so um, de Lubac was concerned about more broadly about secularism um naturalism and the risk was not you know denying that man has a natural end it was denying the human being's relationship with the supernatural does the supernatural have any relevance to ordinary man at all to natural man at all that he saw as this pastoral problem as the the question of the day and so most of his writing focuses on that supernatural end because he thought that it was the supernatural end not the natural end that was being undermined no. uh, of course he grants the natural end when he's pressed on it um but uh he the supernatural end is what he talks about more yeah let me quote your last paragraph here in this uh, myth debunking section Quote from Sarah Hulse Kirby, in, de in de emphasizing natural beatitude, de Lubac pu pushed back against the, re the renient naturalism and secularism of post-war France, uh, post-World War I France, right? You're talking about post-World I France, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. The, the contemporary crisis, as he saw it, was not the denial of natural ends, but the perceived uh, irrelevance. What's that? But both World War One and World War Two. OK, that's true. I mean, because he said the same things after both wars. All right. Yeah. Was not the denial of natural ends, but the perceived irrelevance of the su supernatural to natural man and ordinary life and ordinary life. You have, I got new glasses. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still adjusting to them. His one sided emphasis on the supernatural end is clarified against that context. I think that's extremely important. I mean, I've, I always say uh, in being in giving any theologian a charitable reading, it is always important to embed them in the context of their times, not to historicize their thought away, but to, to realize what it is they're reacting against. I, I can't remember who, but a, but a, a thinker who once said, and I, I, an intellectual of some kind, I can't remember his name, said that you can, most, you can best understand uh, great thinkers in history by understanding first what it was they most feared. In other words, what what is it that they think is the the greatest danger of the moment? And once you identify that, you can really identify what's motivating them, what gets them out of bed, why they're writing it all. And I think that as de Lubac surveyed the French, you know, landscape and saw this aggressive secularism, I thought I think I think you're absolutely right, Sarah, here. I think he de-emphasized the natural end so as not to make it seem as if the, the human nature as such is completely complete without without God, without grace, without supernatural elevation and so on. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why he's concerned with the pure nature theory. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
to begin with, because he's looking for an explanation of, of um, the, the origins of secularism. What, what are the theological origins of it, of the idea that the human being can be, you know, perfectly happy and fulfilled just within, um, you know, what Taylor calls the imminent frame or just, just within the confines right. of this world that we don't need to look to God, you know, that God is basically irrelevant to um, ordinary life. Um, and so he locates that in this pure nature theory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's his, his work is coming from this more pastoral concern for, um, right. Right. You know, which is why he wrote that great book, which was so important to me in my early twenties when I read it was the drama of atheist humanism. Exactly. Uh, and he takes up Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, August Comte, uh, the sociologist and so forth. And what he's essentially aggressively analyzing there are what are the sources of modern secularism? And ultimately, the sources are nihilistic. Uh, and, and and thus the humanism proposed by modern atheism, modern secularism, which he sort of equates, the, the humanism proposed there is actually an anti-humanism. It's a it's a deeply dangerous anthropology that is destructive. And so uh, de Lubac is trying to retrieve, and we would both appreciate this coming from de Sales and Francis de Sales, a Christian humanism, uh, not to, in a sense, therefore deny the importance of the naturally human you know, and, and to find the, the basic constitutive categories of human nature as such, but to, in a sense, show how the Christian vision actually provides us with a deeper, more robust and more, more profound retrieval of what it means to be human. And that includes that call to a supernatural end. And as soon as you destroy that call to a supernatural end and simply replace it with a purely natural human nature, you are playing right into the hands of these secularizing forces. Yeah, that's right. And you also destroy the human person. Yes. And so he shows in Drama of Atheist Humanism that, um, you know, the link between, you know, the, the bloodiest century in history and um, the uh, beliefs that were undergirding it, it wasn't um, because of Christian religious beliefs that all of these, you know, millions of people were put to death in the 20th century. It's because of specifically atheistic um ideologies that are undergirding Marxism and um, Nazism. He connects Nazism to. Um, oh, yeah. He brings in Nazism the, in, the, in the whole nine yards. Right. Exactly. Right, so let's let's move on to myth number five. Sure. Myth number five. De Lubach downplays the Eucharist in order to emphasize the communion of believers. Uh, I This is a this is a criticism of De Lubach that I had actually never heard before. Well, I'm not a De Lubach scholar, as you are. I have just read his books and it never even crossed my mind to think that de Lubach was de-emphasizing the Eucharist in anything that I read by him. And yet, so I was a bit stunned when I read, uh, you know, this accusation from some that he de-emphasizes the Eucharist. So, so go ahead and, and debunk this myth that de Lubach downplays the Eucharist. Sure. Yeah. And this one, again, I heard I had a student come up to me after class one day and he said, well, Dr. Hulse doesn't de Lubach deny the real presence. And he's just all about, you know, horizontal communion among, among believers. And he de-emphasizes the need for the sacraments. And so I Googled this and this is actually a popular myth about him on various, um, you know, so-called traditionalist websites. Um, so de Lubach writes a, a book in um, first published in 1944 then he revises it in 1949, it comes out again, um, called Corpus Mysticum, where um, he illustrates that in the early church, um, sacramental and ecclesial communion are linked. And so um, he's holding together, you know, the Eucharist and the church, showing that not only does the church and her priests make the Eucharist, but the Eucharist actually makes um, the church. We become what we eat. We become the body of Christ through commonly consuming um, the body of Christ. And um, so Dave Lubach in no way is undermining uh, the real presence. What he says is that in modernity, due to this influence of rationalism, people become obsessed with the question of the real presence, um, you know, gathering proofs for it and, and having kind of absolute certainty for it in abstraction from um, the relationship between the, the sacramental and um, and the ecclesial uh, body of Christ. So an abstraction from the church. 
Um, but de Lubac in no way undermines the real presence, nor does he say that we don't need the Eucharist. And in fact, in 1972, um, he writes, um, you know, the liturgical celebration would become nothing more than a community of assembled persons uh, were we to not have the sacraments, were we to not have the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is yeah. that which makes the church, but he doesn't want to view the church or the Eucharist in abstraction. He wants to view um, the, the threefold body of yeah. Christ in its interrelationship. Yeah, I mean, uh, Balthazar talks about the corpus triforme. Uh, the threefold body of Christ, which ultimately I think I could be wrong about this, but I think is grounded in an older patristic Alexandrian uh, theology where there are three fundamental incarnations of the word. The first most primary, most fundamental is in Christ himself, who is revelation as such, therefore. Then you have the embodiment of the incarnation of the word in scripture, which is the privileged witness to the primary incarnation in Christ. But then you have the ecclesial incarnation of the word in the church, which is the home in which both scripture and, 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 and the memory of Christ and in office and sacrament persist down through history. And that also is an incarnation. And therefore, what, what, what de Lubac is trying to emphasize here, along with Balthazar and others, is the, this corporate nature of the church and that the Eucharist always has to always already has to be viewed within the structure of a corporate view of salvation and a corporate view of the church and not in this overly uh, individualistic, which is really ultimately quite modern, right? And individually, uh, that's why De Lubac a sense, accuses the neo-scholastics of being the nouvelle theologie, as you say right. in here at some point, right? You're the novelty. You're the ones who are ignoring the broader tradition in favor of this very forensic church as perfect society with all kinds of structures and definitions that are clearly delineated. And my salvation is a kind of me and Jesusism, and, uh, and, and, and this obsession then with the real presence and because that's but I mean, it's a bit of a tangent and I'll, I'll let you talk again uh, is I, I once was uh, at a parish. This is many, many years ago in which the priest was on vacation. And so the deacon of the parish, instead of a daily mass, had a communion service. Uh, and I remember I was there for the communion service, which lasted about 10 minutes. And I remember several people saying as they left. Oh, geez, I wish we could just do this more often instead of instead of mass, because mass is long and this is really short. So what it what it and I kind of chuckled to myself because in one sense, it's a nice you can understand the insight there, which is the high point of the mass is reception of the Eucharist in some sense in the eyes of many. And it's certainly in my eyes, too. I mean, uh, I love to receive the Eucharist and I understand that, but, uh, but how also, <laughs> how short sighted is that? To, it shows that the focus is just on the real presence of Christ and that the only real purpose of going to mass is, is to receive communion, that there is no other purpose, worship, praise, giving God glory, share, uh, you know, uh, attaching my praise and worship of God to that of the priest at the altar with the high priest Christ and the Eucharistic elevation. And so, no, 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 none of that. I just want communion so I can get the heck out of here. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's what de Lubac is fighting. That's the, that's the kind of thing that he's arguing against here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in Catholicism, he makes the argument, so Catholicism, that's 1938, uh, he makes the argument that Marxism may not have happened had the church been more in touch with um, her, um, you know, existence as a social body and, um, you know, not just individually focused. At that moment in history, he thought that there was this individualist kind of piety, which, like you said, I think still persists to this day, this kind of me and Jesus thing, um, which, you know, De Lubac wouldn't want to deny uh, the personal relationship with Jesus. Oh, it's he, got, he, there's, there's yeah. obviously an individual component here. And oh, there's an individual be, component. Exactly. We want to be clear it's about not, that. It's yeah. not everything. And he thinks that had the church, um, again, more properly expressed her social aspect, that um, Marxism may have been circumvented because he sees in Marxism what people are actually like, what people go to in Marxism is what people are actually looking for um, that can That's be right. found in the 
church. Yeah. And you did your dissertation on, on De Lubach's Trinitarian theology. And this looms large here because part of the of the retrieval of the fathers that one sees in resource month theologians is precisely uh, their Trinitarian uh, theology in many ways, uh, because what needs to be emphasized is the linkage between the Trinitarian God, Christ, and our proper understanding of our anthropology. God is an infinite series of gift reception, a perichoresis of infinite gift and reception. Christ is the man pro nobis, all right, for others, poured out for others. And our discipleship in Christ, the fundamental nature of a human being made in the image and likeness of God, is that we are creatures oriented towards the divestment of the self-divestment of charity. And so any notion of salvation, which wants to emphasize a, a more monadic, individualistic concept of, of me and uh, my salvation, my Jesus, my reception of communion, that then turns around and ignores the essentially perichoretic, kenotic, divesting, pro nobis elements of gift reception of human nature leads to precisely the distortions in the church that led to the rise of Marxism and some of the other various isms of the 20th century. That's right. Yeah. So that's my view and I'm sticking with it. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's just it's absurd to, in a sense, uh, take De Lubach grossly out of context here and say that because he wants to emphasize once again this communal aspect of the church, her corporate nature and of her sacraments, therefore he's downplaying uh, the Eucharist is a symptom amongst the critics themselves that they need to do some serious retooling of, of their own theological concept of the relationship between anthropology and uh, and theology. Right. Anyways, myth number six, De Lubach was enthusiastic. I, I love this one, too, by the way, because I've just recently been revisiting this whole issue. De Lubach was enthusiastic about Joachim of Fiori and recommended his ideas. Now, for our viewers who don't know, Joachim of Fiori was a theologian, uh, medieval, who wrote um, extensively about the three ages, you know, of the church. There's the age of the Father, the age of the Son, and we're now living in the age of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean to overly simplify this, uh, but that in the age of the Holy, there was a sort of antinomian enthusiasm in in the sort of age of the Spirit in which we now live, uh, which which radically undermines and calls into question the juridical structures of the church, the sacramental structures of the church, the magisterium of the church, all the visible structural signs of the church. That all pertains to the age of Christ, you know, stage number two. But we're now liberated from all of that. And there are echoes of this in the modern church. Uh, God is doing a new thing. You see this in the synodal way where the Holy Spirit suddenly sounds like Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and and uh, yeah, suddenly we, we've suddenly now discovered for the first time in 2000 years that the Holy Spirit, you know, wants all these things that the church has said for a long time. But that's indicative of a notion that th there is a kind of Marcionism here. There's a kind of um, um, Montanist sort of enthusiasm here in, in Joachim's age of the spirit that is not dead. And so therefore it is it is an important issue as to whether or not de Lubach uh, is endorsing the views of Joachim et Fiori. So go ahead and debunk the myth that he is endorsing those views. Okay, sure. So again, this is one that I just encountered um, basically by accident um, on the internet. Uh, but yeah, people have been saying that de Lubach um, endorses Joachim of Fiore, um, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And so he writes this two volume, you know, massive work at the end of his, towards the end of his theological career, 1979 and 1981, on um, what he calls the spiritual posterity of Joachim of Fiore. So um, those who um, were influenced by Joachim's ideas and, and spread them um, over the centuries. Um, they look Lubach writes the book not because he agrees with Joachim, but because he thinks that Joachimism is a pressing danger, and he especially sees it, um, and, and that's, you know, his expression is a, quote, pressing danger, um, especially after the council. Um, and so some keys to, to Joachim's thought, he thought that the spirit um, surpassed the father and the son, and that the age of the 
spirit surpassed the father and the son. He thought that there would be a new gospel that surpassed the old and new Testament, um, that there would be, um, kind of giving a new reading to them, um, that there'd be a new church, that the hierarchical church would, would go away and that we'd have a, a new, um, church of, of monks and kind of more, um, he was emphasizing spirit, you know, downplaying institution, right. pitting right. things. Um, yeah. And then also um, the eschaton would, um, or at least the features traditionally associated with the eschaton would actually occur in time. Um, So there'd be this age of peace and happiness in time. Um, In any case, um, Dave Lubach diagnoses um, uh, utopian socialism as as Yoakimus. So he has in mind um, Kamm's religion of humanity. Um, but then also German idealism, um, Hegel, and then eventually he, um, you know, also diagnoses Marx as, as Joachimist, and then up through, um, the council, he sees various trends after the council as, as Joachimist that again, think that the spirit is doing something new that is detached from that, which came before that there's an entirely right. new reading of scripture, that there's an entirely new church. Um, and, and so that's his that's his concern yeah and i think it's it's a concern we should all still now have because a lot of the voices pushing the synodal way speak exactly like this that we are now entering into a kind of uh, a new church a new environment uh, that the holy spirit is now out there moving to to sort of in as many ways dissolve dissolve the, the the sort of traditional structures of the church in this corrosive acid of a kind of spiritualism. What's in, now, this book by de Lubac on Joachim is not translated from the French, is it? Right. Yeah, that's correct. And I think so, that, that might be why the myths are out there. Well, just it, it's people. also it's also indicative of something. See, I'm cynical. I'm a cynical SOB. And and the thing is this, is that when you go out into the interwebs and you inspect the blogosphere of, of the rad sure. trads and various other trads what you find is they quite often descend into talking points that they have received from others about resource month guys i I see it all the time in their treatment of hans urs von balthasar Uh, they'll say something about balthasar that is just clearly wrong and you wonder where in the heck did they get this and then you see many other trads repeating the same dadgum mistake and you say just where they get well it's because somebody somewhere back in an urschrift document of some kind right said here's the problem with balthazar and it's very very clear that that person has never really done a serious study of balthazar uh and, and they're just inventing stuff out of whole cloth and then that becomes boilerplate and so the reason why I think this narrative is caught on about De Lubac is because it is in French. Very few English speakers uh, have read it, especially among trads, and because they already view uh, De Lubac as a dangerous modernist, because uh, da- he liked Teilhard de Chardin, didn't he? Right. A dangerous modernist. Therefore, oh, look, he wrote a book on Joachim. Therefore, he must be a pusher must, of Joachim. Of All right. And so then that becomes the talking point. Yeah. De Lubac, he was a big fan of Joachim. Actually. So thank you for this section here, because it could not be more timely and more important right now in the current historical moment of the church to establish that De Lubac was resolutely opposed to Joachimism, if you want to call it that. Yeah, absolutely. And and he also says that his despair over this um, Joachimist spirit in the church after the council was greater than the despair um, that that he suffered when he was silenced um, in the 50s by his religious order. Yeah, um, because what, a, gr- what a grand deep. what a grand betrayal that was. And he understood it. Yeah. Um, but while we're on the topic, since his name came up. And it is often used also as a criticism of de Lubac. He was a bit of a supporter of Teilhard de Chardin, was he not? He was. He was. Mm-hmm. Did you think there was some kind of simply of a Jesuit sympathy for a fellow Jesuit there? Or that he, he simply had sympathy with any theologian who was unfairly criticized by the magisterium or something that he was coming to the defense of a little a, a poor besieged Jesuit paleontologist who was in theologian who. You know, I'm not a fan of Taylor de Chardin. Some of his writings are quite beautiful. I've yeah. gotten inspiration from them. There's a lot of great stuff in there. But at the end of the day, I mean, Balthazar is very critical of Taylor. So here would be a point perhaps of difference between Balthazar and de Lubac, because 
Baldazar viewed Taylorianism as, as in many ways the way de Lubac views Joachimism. Right. Yeah. Um, I intentionally stayed away from the the Tayar issue in my dissertation just because it's it's such a big one. Um, I will say this that de Lubac he says that the the um, you know, deepest motivation, and I'm paraphrasing, but like the deepest motivation in his life is to evangelize. He was an apologist through and through. Yeah. And um, the way that I have, you know, tried to, un tried to interpret his um, endorsement of, of Teilhard or his interest there is that, um, you know, Teilhard was trying to reconcile science, you know, and religion. Right. Right. And bridge that gap um, in a way that Catholics, you know, de Lubac describes this as, as his intention that Catholics wouldn't have to necessarily like leave their faith in order to be scientific. And so I, I've interpreted de Lubac as having sympathy for de Chardin because he, um, out of this kind of evangelical, well, you know, motivation. I, I think that that is exactly right, Sarah. I really do. I think that uh, we need to remember that Taylor represented one of the very first Catholic theological attempts to come to grips with the modern scientific theory of biological and cosmic evolution. Uh, and, you know, Taylor uses a lot of nebulous language, the Omega point and that can be taken. The new, sphere. You know, yeah, the, you, know, the, you know, that can be taken in new, new agey kind of ways. But this, this goes to the heart of, of you know being making sure that we give a charitable reading to people and not immediately pigeonhole them in certain ways and i think you're absolutely right i think de lubach simply had a great and deep appreciation on an intellectual level for the fact that tailhard was trying to do something important theologically here in reconciling the catholic faith with modern evolutionary theory i think tailhard went too far in that regard it was a flawed attempt at this reconciliation, but it nevertheless, it remains instructive for us as, as a kind of pedagogy and how to engage the world. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't have any big issue with De Lubac embracing Taylor, uh, in, in, in some ways. So, you know, big deal. Mm -hmm. Anyway, number seven, De Lubac, the last myth, De Lubac was trying to do new theology. We're, we're obviously we've talked about this a little bit before, but go ahead. Why new, la nouvelle theologie? Talk about that. Yeah. So um, this term was applied um, to de Lubac and others, um, Boyard, Daniel Lu, um, but it was not applied um, by those theologians. It was applied by others, um, including Garrigou Lagrange, um, <clears throat> who who published an article. In 1946, the new theology, where where is it going? Um, and so the term was intended pejoratively to describe um, this group of theologians. And um, what was distinctive about these theologians, there's a book, um, La Nouvelle Theologie by um, Jurgen Metapenegin, that's really good on this. He says that, you know, these thinkers did not identify themselves as a movement. The idea that they were a movement was actually kind of projected onto them. But um, at the same time, there were some common features that these thinkers shared. Um, and one of them was trying to bridge the gap between uh, what JP2 goes on to call later faith and life. Um, they thought that, uh, yeah, the articles of faith had, had nothing to say to the ordinary human person. They were... Um, Right. Oh, let's well, I'll stop there for a second, because, it, I mean, it's one of the, the strongest accusations by these people against Blondell. For example, Blondell's famous definition of truth, which is the correspondence of mind with life rather than mind with reality, as if Blondell is opposing, you know, those two things against each other. He wasn't. He was simply making the same point that John Paul was making later and, 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 and the Nouvelle theologians were making as well. Uh, so, so go ahead, Sarah. No, that, that's great. Thanks. So exactly. So they're trying to overcome this um, divorce between um, objectivity and, and subjectivity that, again, I think John Paul II does later, um, where, you know, at, at least for JP2, who I think is very much influenced by these guys, um, he's, he's trying to show, for example, in his theology of the body, 
study how um, the church's teachings on sexual morality correspond with our desire, correspond with human experience. So these are not artificial impositions on our freedom. They're not right. random rules made up by this random God, um, but they actually correspond with our experience. And I think that um, for these, you know, quote, new theologians, they were trying to show the link between faith and life. And at least for De Lubac, he was certainly not trying to overthrow the faith. Um, he was, um, I think, an obedient son of the church, um, but he was trying to show how um, the faith corresponded with human experience. Um, he's very clear, by the way, that he does not, not see exper uh, human experience as um you know, the standard of truth in the sense of, well, because I had this experience, therefore it must be true. Key. He allows yeah. revelation to shed light on experience. But again, he allows revelation to shed light on experience. So he looks to find revelation reflected in his human experience um, so that re revelation speaks to natural man. I mean, this was really the point of my dissertation, Trinitarian anthropology. Yeah. How is the Trinity reflected in the human person? Why is it deeply relevant to us? What light does it shed on the human person? So this he's trying is, to bridge that divorce. Absolutely. And this is an absolutely critical point. And which is why yeah. I think the, the, the race horse month guys and I refuse to call, refuse to call them the, the new veil theologians, because exactly. that is a pejorative insult and should not be used in the title of a book or anything that is trying to be objective and fair. Uh, obviously, historically, that's what they were called. But it needs to be acknowledged that, uh, and I'm not criticizing like Minard's book here, which has Nouveau Theology in its title, because it's, it's a historical book. But anyway, uh, what's key here, of course, what's at stake is what sometimes is pejoratively called correlational theology, right? <laughs> and the idea is that theology, in order to be, to speak in an evangelizing tone that that really reaches uh, people where they are, uh, has to be correlated with the absolute historical conditions of the time, with the, the with the you know, bracing needs of human nature in our time, and so on. And yeah, that's what Vatican II meant by reading the signs of the times. But this explains why De Lubac was so crushed and disappointed by the post-Vatican II. Uh, misappropriation of the council's call for aggiornamento as simply the elevating of one end of that binary of correlational theology, experience and revelation, those two binaries, which are interplaying with each other, as Balthazar shows in his whole trilogy, the, the, the interplay between subjective and objective. I mean, the post-conciliar church simply said, we're going to just run with the subjective. We're just human experience, whatever it is, is now the boilerplate for how we're going to proceed. And theology, you, you end up with the human experiential tale wagging the ecclesiastical dog uh, right. a, a, instead of the other way around. And this is this is De Lubac then screaming from the rafters in the late 60s and 70s, no, 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 a thousand times no. You, you are just as the neo-scholastics misunderstood what we were doing. Now you progressives are misunderstanding what we were doing. Right, exactly. Yeah. So there's a great quote here. You say, as we saw it, De, as he saw it, De Lubac was not inventing new theology, but rediscovering the tradition. Indeed, his critique of the renient neo-scholasticism, particularly its theory of pure nature, was that it, it was the new theology, a modern advent that was unfaithful to the work of Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic tradition. Wow, that's 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 saying a lot right there. I put a big exclamation point by that one. In my notes. <laughs> and, and many people have have pointed that out, you know, that, that actually De Lubac is calling pure nature and, and um, neo Thomism uh, new theology. And so, I mean, yeah, that's it. And he saw that's, himself. Yeah, that's the true, the true new theology. Tradition. Yeah, true new yeah. theology. Of course, we can toss these labels and these terms around. And ultimately, they're they're very polemical Um and therefore, I, I think we are in, uh, by way of conclusion, because uh, we need to wrap this up, we're through the seven myths. Uh, I think we're now where we are now in a historical moment in the church, which is in crisis, uh, I think, very strongly in crisis, as we see the return with a vengeance of the post-conciliar progressivism in a kind of new and updated modality, misusing the synodal way. Cardinal Supic, I just had an article out in Catholic World Report today, misusing the theology of Benedict and so on. Uh, I think that it's really important, very important, along, and this is Matthew Levering's point, it's Matthew Minard's point, that the Thomists and the communio theologians set aside a lot of these polemics. 
uh, and, and these historical wounds and these historical hurts and, and realize that right now we need to make common cause because both the resource Mont communio theologians and the, the, the Thomistic theologians, both are orthodox. Both take the church's tradition seriously. Both want for the good of the church uh, and both prioritize revelation in Christ and the Trinitarian God and the importance of the sacraments and the doctrinal apparatus of the church. And so I think it's really, that's why I really wanted to talk to you today, Sarah, because I've spoken with Matthew Minard and Matthew Levering before, you know, about some of the mythology surrounding neo-scholasticism that need to be debunked and communio thinkers need to listen to those debunking of those myths as well. It wasn't simply all rationalistic turtles all the way down. There was a great deal in neo-scholasticism that is worthy of retrieval. Um, and likewise, I think your efforts now to demythologize, if you want to put it that way, these these memes about De Lubach and the Resource Mont guys is part of this project. I can't I can't recommend this uh, as I hope it sees the light of day. I hope it gets published somewhere because it's well worth being published uh, in my peer reviewed sense <laughs> for what my my peer reviewing is worth. So do you have any last thoughts, Sarah? Uh, no, just thank you so much, Larry. This is really, you know, you you taught me theology. And so, I mean, I, I'm a theologian, really. You were the first person that inspired me to go into theology. So this is really cool well, for me. I took I, th your, Thank you for that. Theory. I mean, I, I, I began your teaching in theology, but I suspect that you have been taught by folks far better than I down at the Institute in particular. And I mean, uh, especially been... David L. Schindler, may he rest in peace. God bless him. Yeah, I've been so, so blessed. And yeah, you got, you kicked this all off for me in your faith and reason class. You taught me about nature and grace, you know, when I was a junior in college and just, a, I wasn't a theology major. I was, it was a, you know, um, weren't you a, the, weren't you a theater major? I started as theater, then I was communications. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you told me one day in class, you said, you know, Hulse, you need to go get your PhD and come back and teach for us one day. You're going to do that. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I, I want to go be an actress. And then you know, years later, here I am in your old office. <laughs> which, in my old office. Not, you know, not a, lot, not a lot of people know that actually I have a theatrical background as well. I mean, That's when right, I was yeah. high school and so for college, I, I uh, was very involved in theater. I had a lot. I, w I excelled in the comedic roles. I had a lot of lead roles in, in comedic uh, plays. Hard to imagine. <laughs> I wasn't very good at the drama because I couldn't evoke the proper the proper tears at the right moments or the seriousness. I, I was, I'm a born class clown. And so, yeah, I, I, I could, I could do the comedic roles. Uh, but anyway, so thank you for, you know, that I loved having you in class and here you are teaching and, you know, residing in my old office and uh, uh, more power to your career. Now that you're a freshly minted PhD and thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This has been a fun conversation. And I, and I thank all of you for joining us. Thank you again. Bye-bye now.